What's up, everyone, and welcome to the first ever episode of After the Arch. I'm Andy Payton. I'm Carlos Simpson Moss. And I'm Zach Blank. So, uh, what you guys been up to recently? It's been a little while since I've seen you guys. Yeah, I've been chilling, playing a lot of 2K. Um, my actual podcast mic is coming in soon, so for now we have our Wii karaoke microphone, as you can see. Uh, but overall, it's been a good time. Yeah, I mean, I've just been enjoying some nice weather down here in Florida, hitting the beach a little since my state's reopened. Yeah, I mean, personally, my quarantine has is, is probably not been as good as your guys'. Um, first, I live in Maryland, and uh, reopening has not started happening yet, so been at home for a lot of this and uh just caught my finger yesterday so I'm pretty bandaged up had to get a tetanus shot today um yeah it's it's really been pretty tragic so far has has anything else happened to you like I thought I I thought I heard about maybe a possible internship may have happened yeah you you could you could say that too um I I, I'm in the middle of a of a pretty intense prank war right now um it started out with our friend Ethan Zach and uh and first what happened was um, he started like, like spam texting me. Um, so I got, I got kind of mad. And then um, I, I may have signed him up for a certain dating service and exaggerated his preferences. Uh, so I retaliated. And, and then in response, he retaliated back. And, and uh, it, I got an email the other night, like right after he had found out about the dating thing. I got an email like an hour later from what looked like a recruiter at Google who I uh, was reaching out to middle students to, to recruit for uh, a news internship position. And, and basically I got sucked in to, to uh, doing interview questions and, and all the stuff over email. I had to stay up late to write this essay for him. So I, I had to, I had to stay up writing interview questions. Um, he said he really liked my stuff. So I was really pumped because, you know, this Google recruiter said that they liked what I was doing. Um, so the next morning we set up, uh, a zoom interview like a full official interview and i hopped on the zoom and i at first i heard this uh this really nice british accent uh from from you know a panel of five people everybody's uh video screens were off so all i could hear were the voices and little did i know that it was carlos who was the voice of the main recruiter yeah we uh so we'd known about this idea for a couple of days and so we all planned a time. We all hopped on your interview. Um, we looked up actual employees at Google and changed our Zoom names to that. Uh, and so then I just, it was honestly, I thought a poor accent, but it worked. Uh, and I just asked, I said, we we're going to ask Blank some questions. And then I, the first question I asked was, how do you plan on getting back at Ethan Zach? We all turned our cameras on and it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty beautiful. <laughs> and there, there, is a, there is a video of this for everyone listening and watching this on YouTube right now. So if, if blank feels like it, maybe this video could be released. Yeah, there, there is a video, uh, that one might stay in the vaults for a little while, but if, <laughs> if there's a lot of fan, uh, desire for the video, I'll see about making an exception, but yeah, so, so in the middle of a prank war, um, and taking suggestions for how I should get our friend, Ethan Zach back. All right, but that's enough about us. On today's After the Arch, we have ex-Northwestern punter and ex-DC defenders punter Hunter Nicewander. We had a great talk with Hunter, so let's go to that now. I'm the quarterback, Corson. Nicewander, the punt. Jackson, very busy. Back to receive. And a great bounce for the Wildcats. Can they touch up? The answer is yes. What a punt for Nice Wander. Come to Nice Wander. It is back to kick it away. Keenan Reynolds for Seattle. That kick better go beyond the 20, and it does. To the 15, here's Reynolds. Up the middle of the field, out to the 31 yard line. I'd like to welcome our first ever guest to the After the Arch podcast. He's one of the greatest high school kickers of all time in the state of Ohio, an all Big Ten academic honoree, a two-time Big Ten Special Teams Player of the Week for the Northwestern Wildcats, the first specialist selected in the XFL draft, literally kicked off the XFL season for the D.C. Defenders. He was all pro in the XFL. Mr. HTP, Hunter the Punter, 
Hunter Nice Wander, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me on. Of course. Thank you for uh, coming on with us. It's really exciting. That was quite the intro. I appreciate it. <laughs> so how's, how's your quarantine been, man? You working out? You staying in shape? I tell you what, man, it's a little different. I'm sure it's a little different for everyone. But yeah, I'm, fortunately, I'm blessed and able to work out. My wife's friend has a little gym in her basement. So we're driving there pretty much every day to go work out. And then we got a local middle school field where I haven't gotten kicked off yet. Fingers crossed. Uh, that's been working out for me. So yeah, we're in a blessed situation over here for the most part. To have this arrangement work out with you and your wife's friend? Do you just like hit them up or, or how do you uh, get to use their gym? So I was obviously I was working out at a gym wherever our XFL practice was. And then when that was over, I started looking gyms nearby that were still open. So I was able to work out at like a local export mm-hmm. and then that closed. And then so I was like, OK, I'll make do with our apartment gym. And then sure enough, like a week later, that closed. So then we just got to thinking like, where the heck am I going to work out? And then she remembered uh, one of her best friends has like a little gym in her basement. And so um, I've been driving about 40 minutes each way every day to go work out there. Make and do, make and do. Exactly. That's the dedication, the grind that you need. Glad to hear you haven't been kicked out of the park like Tom Brady either. (laughs) Oh, I've gotten kicked out of four or five parks, four or five high schools. But this middle school, there's no fence there. So I think I'm safe. That's (laughs) crucial. All right, so we wanted to start out talking about your experience in the XFL. Um, so clearly you play for my hometown, my favorite team, D.C. Defenders. You got the hat right there. Um, and uh, in your time in the XFL, you led the league in yards per punt. So kind of when the XFL was starting up, what were your initial reactions to what was going on? And at what point did you realize that, that you were going to be a part of, of this thing called the XFL? Yeah, so I had watched like the 30 for 30, I believe, on the original XFL. Um, so that was like my prior knowledge to it. And then when this, I heard this coming back with Vince McMahon, um, and I saw the Alliance vote, I'm like, well, if this starts up, this could actually be a real opportunity after watching the whole Alliance deal and seeing, um, some of the guys who were able to go through that and then work their way back to the NFL. So as soon as it came around, I was definitely interested in it since I was a free agent and hadn't had any NFL experience yet, really, um, so I actually um, got invited to like a showcase camp where you go and for me, it was basically just punting and kicking and they evaluate you and there's, you know, a few other guys there who they're interested in evaluating. So I was able to go to that and from that, I got invited to the draft list and then from there, fortunately, I was drafted to the DC Defenders. There we go. <laughs> So you, you just mentioned the draft list. Um, the Expo draft overall was pretty behind the scenes. Uh, so how did you find out when you were drafted? Um, was it kind of a similar thing uh, to the NFL draft, how we see draftees being all excited about that? What was that process like? It was definitely different. So I basically knew it was different because there was like positional drafts and then you had like an open draft phase and specialists couldn't get drafted. I knew until that open draft phase. Uh, but from that open draft phase, I think there was like 30 rounds or something. So I had no idea. I knew it was on a certain day, but it was literally all day that day. So um, I'm pretty close to my father-in-law, lived right down the road from them. So we ended up just going golfing because I was like, I'm not just going to wait around and see what happens. I want to go do something, take my mind off of it. So we ended up getting to the golf course. We had a tee time and started pouring down rain. And we're like, screw it. We're going to still golf. Like we're here. Let's just do it. So we ended up only playing nine holes. I got back. I was freezing cold. So I was about to literally hop in the shower and my phone rang. (laughs) And I realized that I got drafted in like the first round of the open draft phase. So I ended up not having to wait that long. So it was was a really exciting day. Um, And to all our Barstool fans out there. So we saw that uh, PFD commenter. He's my fellow DC sports fan. Came to visit you guys pretty early in training camp. What was that experience like? And I even saw you got to hold a couple kicks for him. Yeah, so he was um, he was a pretty unique guy, pretty cool guy. Uh, got to hang out with him a good bit, but he was fresh off of the national championship game, and uh, he he had let me know that he said, you know, be aware I might need might not be on my A game, 
because he was he said he had a few late nights there in New Orleans. But um, no, it's a good time, and I definitely think it was it was good publicity for both sides. And I think he he's he thinks he has a future, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. I heard him say the other day that he he says within thirty yards, ninety percent of the time he'll make the kick. Yeah, I think NFL guys are about a hundred percent from there. So. <laughs> we'll see how he does. He might want to stick to uh, social media for now. Yeah, he's doing well there. That's for sure. What's up, man? What's going on? How's it going? Good to meet you on PFT. Awesome. Great, great. Nice to meet you. How man. you feeling? I like the one bar. I'm jealous of that. Thank you. Thank you. you. Ever wear one of these? I have not had the joy of wearing one of these. So I'm kind of an alpha on you already. Yeah, pretty much. I'm not afraid of and a the diaper pad. Oh, yeah. You got the diaper it's pad too. Um, also, I'm going to need number seven for me. Uh, I don't think so. Eight looks better. You got a charity? I'll, I'll donate to your charity. How much? What's your charity called? I'll have to think about it. You don't have a charity? I don't have a charity right you, now. Why do you hate charity? I love charity. You have a charity if you love it so much. Uh, so as we said in the intro, you kicked off the uh, inaugural season, uh, and that ball is now in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, uh, which is pretty close to your hometown, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so what does that feel like? How was the experience kicking off, and uh, how does it feel to be such a big part of history? Yeah, it was really cool to kick off the XFL season, and at that point I didn't really uh, – know that it was going to be going into the Hall of Fame, but I knew it was the opening kickoff of the XFL. So I made sure that I signed the ball. I didn't know if I was going to get it back or, you know, what was going to happen to it, but I wanted to make sure that I knew which ball it was and that it had my name on it. So I signed actually HTP on the laces. Um, And then afterwards, Andrew Luck came up to me. He's like, you know, that ball is going in the Hall of Fame, right? And I was like, what? And Obviously, it's during the game, so you don't think much about it. And then afterwards, I saw, like, the Pro Football Hall of Fame tweet something out and stuff. So that was that was pretty cool. Your initials on the ball are in the Hall of Fame right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, wow. hopefully. Hopefully, they didn't take it out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the XFL ball is still there. Did you say that Andrew Luck was at that game? I'm sorry, Oliver ball? Luck. Oliver, Oliver Luck. Luck. Okay. okay. Yeah, Oliver Luck. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been something. <laughs> um. So the season for the Defenders, you played at the brand-new Audi Field, right? Was that a pretty cool place to play? Yeah, it was a really cool, intimate environment. Like, the fans were really close to the field. It only sat about 20,000, but, I mean, we had a sellout that first game, and they showed up for the other two home games, and it was a really cool environment. Of course, you had the, the beer snake in the one end zone, which is pretty wild, um, but the grass there was amazing, like, I, I love a good grass field, and since it's an MLS field, like, that grass was superb. So, that's probably <laughs> what my was favorite. Thought, uh, what was your thought when that beer snake sort of went out for the first time? Yeah, as a, as a D.C. sports fan, I've never seen that from any – I don't think – like, did they come up with that on their own? Like, I've never seen that in any other sort of, like, sporting environment or anything. So, I thought it was pretty unique. Um, I had no idea. We were all kind of looking over there, all the specialists, because we're on the sideline a lot. And we're looking over there, like, what the heck's going on over there? <laughs> and then they eventually, like, announced it. And we're like, oh, my gosh, these people are wild. But, no, it was, it was pretty cool. That's so funny. Um, so, so for me, uh, my favorite part of the XFL season was seeing your guys' two opening dubs um, at home. Uh, you guys started off so strong. Really great way to begin the season. Um, how did the beginning of the season feel? And what do you guys think worked for you um, in those first couple of games? Yeah, so I think it started in training camp. Um, we just came together really quick. There was a lot of Big Ten guys, um, a lot of guys with a decent amount of NFL experience. Uh, so there was just a lot of wisdom in that team environment. And I think we just molded together very quickly because of that. Um, and I think that translated well into the first couple of games. And from there, we kind of had to make adjustments into the next few games. But, no, it was really cool to win those first few games of the XFL and also get a few few extra bucks, too, for winning. So, yeah, it was definitely nice. How much were those uh, incentives for, like, winning games? It was about three grand a week. Damn. So, yeah, not too shabby. My Vipers really missed out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they got us. Hey, they got us down in Tampa. I'll give them that. It's tough to play down in Raymond James. We, oh, we I tell you what. We went out with the win there. That's all that matters. Yeah. I'm over two at Raymond James. Between the Outback Bowl and the Vipers, it's yeah. 
Um, not my not my favorite stadium. Yeah. Yeah. Tennessee game wasn't great. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Alvin Kamara, man. Obviously, uh, the XFL suspended operations with all this coronavirus stuff. Uh, so what was your initial uh, reaction when you got the news from that? Uh, can you describe kind of what happened on that day when you found out that it was no longer going to be operating? Yeah, so I believe the news actually broke as we were finishing up practice. Um, so we all had to come back to the team hotel and we had like a team meeting. Um, and basically the next day we had to turn everything in and do an exit physical and everything. Um, but I mean, I can't say we were shocked at that point. I believe it was like a state of emergency in Maryland and, you know, it seemed pretty serious with the cases piling up. So, um, it was, it wasn't surprising, but it was still disappointing and like tough news because, I think everyone was enjoying the season, fans, the team, the coaches, like you could definitely tell there was momentum building. Um, so it definitely, it definitely wasn't easy, but I think it was, it was definitely fun while it lasted. Overall, do you think like the, would you call the XFL a success? Like say coronavirus didn't happen. Oh yeah, definitely. I think if coronavirus hadn't happened that, um playoffs would have been insane the championship game would have been awesome um and i could definitely see it lasting and even eventually being like uh, a minor league joining the nfl as a minor league or something like that because i think that's inevitable at some point there's going to be a minor league system to the nfl i mean you have the nba has it with the g league now it's mm -hmm. legit they're taking college guys away from colleges you got it with the mlb um it just makes sense to have it for the NFL. So I think it'll happen at some point. Who knows the XFL, you know, could come back, you know, who knows? I was, I was just so amazed. Like I felt like it did so well. Like me and me and blank, we were texting, like I think the first weekend because I forgot like when it was actually starting. And then once I saw it for the first time, I was like, this is so sick. Like yeah. I need to get some Vipers gear and I checked the store and it's just completely sold out. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is really like, this is becoming a big thing. Yeah, I mean, the production was definitely legit, and the people that were involved, I mean, you had ABC, ESPN, Fox, so it was it was legit, and you could definitely tell there was a lot of time and investment put into it. Do you ever have to get mic'd up? Yeah, I got mic'd up a few times. I think one of them was when PFT was there, of course, um, and then some point else during training camp. They did a lot of stuff, though, with players and interviews and stuff, and um, I remember actually I was part of media day and that was insane all under one roof that you had ESPN, ABC, Fox, XFL league stuff. And you were just going around in a circle to all these different booths doing interviews and videos and stuff. And it's kind of, it's kind of sad because I don't think, you know, fans even got to see a lot of that because it was only halfway through the season, but there was, it was really cool the stuff they were doing. What would you say was your favorite memory or memorable story from those few games in the XFL? I would say um, the opening kickoff was pretty special. The opening points, being a part of that, uh, holding that kick for Ty, Ty Rouse, our kicker, was pretty pretty special. Um, and then getting named to the to the All Pro team was pretty awesome way to go out. So speaking of memories, what were your guys' uh, post game celebrations like? So I saw you guys get pretty rowdy. I saw some Bud Light seltzers out in the mix. What was that like? Yeah. So I guess our official locker room sponsorship was with Bud Light Seltzer. So, yeah, that got pretty rowdy pretty quick. I, I can't say I, I partook in a lot of that, but it did. You know, we had some music and we were jumping around. and It was a good time. So it was a lot of fun, especially being in that uh, D.C. locker room. It was a good time. So now it's time for our first segment. I like to call it Overrated Underrated, which is brought to you by Fast Fire Blaze Pizza. Um, all you guys should eat Blaze Pizza. Um, so, so, Hunter, we're going to name a topic, and you're going to explain why you think it's overrated or underrated. Carlos, you ready? All right. Yeah, let's go. So first on the list is Buff Joe's Wings. Oh, underrated. Cash only joint. Uh -huh. Legendary spot. Huh. It's open late, open super late. One of the only spots that's open super late. Um, and their wings, phenomenal. Hand-tossed, oh, my gosh. Definitely an underrated spot. 
Those cat's joints are always the best ones. You got to fry Frosty. it. Chicken Shack. If you guys haven't had oh. Chicken Shack, you need to make your way to Chicken Shack. That's the late night go-to right there. Very good answer. Very good answer. Okay, number two is Alex Spanos. <sighs> Underrated, but, I mean, he's coming in hot. Like, he's had a lot of features lately. So, it's like he's not – he's definitely not overrated because the juice is real. Hmm. His energy is real. It's all legit. Like, people might think it's a gimmick or something like that, but the dude brings that literally every single day. But he's pretty well known these days. But I'll still say he's underrated. Fair, fair. Okay. Really important one, Chicago-style deep dish pizza. First of all, you got to go with Lou's. True, true. Um, yes. Lou's is the spot. Come on now. Um, second of all, probably still underrated. Because you got a lot of people that still, you know, it's a Friday or Saturday night. They're, they're ordering, like, Papa John's and Pizza Hut. Like, pay the extra $3, do yourself a favor, and get a deep dish from Luke's. I mean, come on. So I'll make a naughty shout-out. Yeah. All right, some punter, punter action for you. Pat McAfee. Man, I mean, talk about a guy with a lot of buzz. The guy has a lot of attention, big following. But, I mean, I guess he's still underrated. He's a punter. I mean, no one no yeah. one gives him enough credit, I feel like, because, you know, oh, he's, he was a former punter and whatnot. Mm. But the guy's funny, he's intelligent, and he knows what he's talking about most of the time. All right, all underrated so far. Important question for you and Blank. The city of Washington, D.C., overrated, underrated? You got to tread lightly here. This, is, uh, this hits close to home for me. Oh man, I will say I enjoyed I enjoyed Chicago a lot. Chicago mm-hmm. summer is very hard to beat. It's true. Um, but the year round culture here is pretty awesome. And I will say also the traffic to get to DC is pretty brutal. But once you're in DC, I think it's a pretty underrated environment. You think DC, you think like the National Mall and like the museums that are there, and people are like, oh, you know, I've done that once. I don't need to do it again. But they miss out on, like, the Wharf District, which is really cool. It's right along the river. And then you got National Harbor right there. Mm. So I think those areas of D.C. are underrated. That's what I would say. There we go. That's my D.C. plug. Yeah. All You're right. Welcome. So uh, you were part of, unlike us, able to participate in some of the best seasons of Northwestern football history. Uh, so bowl games, overrated, underrated underrated because the bowl games we played in i would say like weren't necessarily the biggest bowl games obviously but the what goes into them and how important they are to each of the schools and how meaningful they are to the fan base i feel like are pretty underrated like winning the music city bowl and the pinstripe bowl that was that was pretty special they give you guys a bunch of cool stuff too right i've heard of people oh, yeah. get like tvs yeah, yeah. So I never got a TV, but I got like <laughs> a really nice puffer jacket from New Era at the Pinstripe Bowl. Um, I got like a a JBL big portable speaker from that as well. Yeah. And then the Music City Bowl. I think we had like a I don't know, like a four hundred dollar gift card to Best Buy. So yeah, oh. it was pretty cool. Damn, yeah. Carlos, we actually missed one. This one was my favorite, overrated, underrated, and that is Leg Day. Is that overrated? Leg Day never underrated <laughs> i mean i mean always always underrated people missed out on that man don't skip the legs need the leg day it's all about the calves nothing like a midsummer calf when the sun hits it right around two o'clock you're on the beach you're on the north shore and that sun hits the calf and you got it you got a nice calf going people will notice that <laughs> your first though. you know what i say skies out thighs out <laughs> As as they say in uh in Miracle, legs feed the wolf. That's right. Amen. And don't sleep on leg day. Never. Um, so so obviously you you've become an extremely accomplished punter between Northwestern defenders, all that. Um, uh, what got you into punting and kicking in the first place? Yeah, so it definitely was my soccer background. Um, I played soccer since I was a little tot and um I, I played football too growing up. I was a quarterback, tight end, middle linebacker going into like middle school. Um, But then I realized I needed to kind of focus on a sport if I wanted to go to college for it. So I actually chose soccer. 
then going into high school, all my friends, you know, wanted me to play football, wanted me to be a part of the team. So about a week before the season started, my freshman year, I was, you know, just sitting around. I was like, oh, I can kick a soccer ball really far. I can probably, you know, hit a football decently far. So I went out there and just tried it out. And a week later, I was starting varsity as a freshman. Um, and so that's where it all started. But honestly, at that point, even through my sophomore year, I was focused on soccer. And then at the end of my sophomore year, I started getting letters for football. And I was like, wait, this Kagan thing, like I can go to college doing this? I had no idea. Like I didn't even think of that. And I started getting D1 letters. And my coach was like, yeah, like you can get a full ride scholarship just kicking a football. And I was like, that I'm going to do that. <laughs> so that's where it all started. I didn't start punting actually till my sophomore year either. So I kicked my freshman year and didn't start punting till my sophomore year. Was Northwestern one of like the first schools to really like look at you? Yeah. Yeah. They started talking to me early on. I think you could start at that time. You could start talking to coaches like beginning of your junior year. And uh, they were one of the first uh, schools to call me. And what were your first impressions of, of coach Fitz? Because we know he has a pretty big personality. Yeah, he's the man. He's another, like Spanos, what you see is what you get. Like, none of that stuff. Like, he's so real and genuine. And that's what I appreciate about him. Like, a lot of the coaches, you know, they'll try to smooth you or, like, talk trash about other schools. And, like, Fitz didn't really do any of that. Like, Coach Fitz, he just, like, kept it real, you know, and really wanted to know me. He made He made some home visits and, like, came to my high school. And so, like, I really respected that and respected just the way he wanted to know me as a person as well as a football player. So we've heard from a couple sources that uh, Coach Fitz sent your mom a Mother's Day card and that that was kind of the <laughs> final reason for your uh, commitment to NU. Can you confirm or deny that? Oh, I can confirm that. That was a nice touch. That was a nice touch. That was the finish. That was the cherry on top, I think. At that point, you know, I was – I was weighing about three schools, three or four schools. And then, you know, he did that. I was like, all right, I respect that. <laughs> Maybe the Mother's Day card is the way the re land recruits now. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I think they get a little more extravagant these days. <laughs> the <Mother's> Day <laughs> so in high school, you kicked multiple 50-yard field goals and were arguably the best kicker in Ohio history. Like, did you ever think about kicking for Northwestern? I did. I actually came in to an all three. Um, and after my retro year, I had just like a minor injury, like I sprained my ankle and I just sat down talking with coach and, um, you know, I knew I was going to be good to go, but we just got to talking and he's like, I really think if, if you want to do this and do this at the next level, I think you need to just like pick one and focus on one. He's like, you, you know, you don't see these guys who do all three make it to the next level. And I really respected that. And I realized that too. And just talking with my parents, I decided to just kind of focus on punting. That's awesome. Uh, and so we know that Northwestern isn't known for like crazy rowdy sports, but we've got to imagine that a lot happens behind the scenes that, that the fans don't see. Uh, so what, what are some of your just like craziest, uh, most memorable Northwestern stories? Oh, definitely, definitely post game locker room dances and the music going. I remember at Nebraska was pretty wild in the locker room after we won in overtime. That was insane. Um, I think we had like some future song just like banging in the background. We were just jumping for good, probably like I, I swear it was like 30 minutes. We were just jumping and dancing around. It was, it was like a huge mosh pit of a hundred sweaty guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, honestly, the the post game locker room celebration was really cool. And then, you know, off the field, just getting to know guys and that personal bond and relationship that you build with the guys on the team, you know, like having Bible studies, going out to eat, just doing all those things that really grow the team and grow that relationship. I think that was really special. And those are the things that I'll remember forever. All right, I got a big question for you. So your wife was also a pretty insane Northwestern athlete. She was an All-American lacrosse player who played both at Northwestern and George Mason and was one of the best players in program history. So I got to ask you, who's the better athlete, you or your wife? Not even a question. She's the athlete <laughs> in the family, that's for sure. Not even a question. Like, she, 
she, I believe, still has the national record for most points in a high school career in the country, guys or girls. So, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. She's pretty insane. Um, and, yeah, she definitely carries athletic genes. That's crazy. We appreciate um, the honesty for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's – I don't even need to think about that. Like, come on now. I'm, I'm a punter. Let's be honest. She was a lacrosse <laughs> player, and she ex- absolutely killed it. So, yeah. And I got one more Northwestern question. Um, so we know in the last couple of years, they really put like a lot of money into their athletic department. Um, there's that whole like $300 million um, Ryan Fieldhouse, which I think came right after you left, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how did that feel? Well, you know what? A little inside scoop. They told me that I would be able to be in that my retro freshman year. So I was, you know, I knew that might be a little quick, but I was hoping to at least get like one year in there. Yeah. And so, yeah, seeing it pop up literally the year after I was gone, I was, you know, I was pretty salty. But uh, I've been back since and I've gotten to, you know, work out in the facility and stuff. And they have a nice, you know, former Northwestern football locker room section. So, you know, I think they're trying to make up for and make us feel welcome there too. <laughs> yeah, I got it. They don't let the non-athletes in there too much, but we've been in there a couple times, and it's it's pretty nice. Yeah, yeah, they definitely – I can see how it took $300 million, that's for sure. <laughs> how do you stay in touch with, with, like, current Northwestern football? Do you, do you follow it a lot? Yeah, so, I mean, I follow – I still follow Northwestern football and all the cat stuff on Twitter and on Instagram, and I uh, try to stay in touch with Coach Fitz and – um all, really all the former players we still you know we still love cats football so we talk about it and that. love to hear that all right so now we've come to another segment uh i like to call this one mailbag pti has a little mailbox we don't have that level of uh of luxury here uh, you'll get there but you'll get there <laughs> basically we just are going to read some questions uh that we asked the audience in this case, it's it's just our friends that we were asking because it's our first episode. Uh, first question is from Beach or B, uh, and he asks, "Do punters ever want the offense to fail on their third down conversion so that they can punt?" Um, I don't think so. I I've never really been in that position. I think maybe if we were up by like 50, 60 points, and I haven't punted yet. But to be honest, I don't think I've ever had a game where I haven't punted. So really, I'm always rooting for the offense. And of course, like I, I want to win. So yeah, I don't think I've been in that situation yet. But I could see I could see how it could come into play potentially, you know, if you're up by a lot, haven't punted yet, it's in the fourth quarter and like coach, you know, you're on your own 30, you know, open field, just let me bomb one real quick. But <laughs> I, I haven't gotten there yet. All right, and then so, so Michael D asks, so you made the all pro team in the XFL. Uh, what do you think the result would be between the best XFL team or, or even just like an all-star XFL team and the worst NFL team? It's a good question. Who's the worst NFL team? I'm thinking Jags. For yeah, this Michael said yeah. the Jags, yeah. Jags. Shout out to the Jags, dang. Um, man, that's a really good question. I think if you put – I think if you put the all-star talent from across the XFL against the, say, Jags, I think it would be competitive. I think it would be competitive. I, and then, I don't know what the score would be. I don't know how close it would be, but it, it would be competitive. Because you got to think a lot of guys in the XFL are either former NFL guys mm. or they're guys who have been in the NFL and, you know, had an injury or got cut for whatever reason. Or, you know, they were bottom of the roster NFL guys for five, six years. So it's not like the, the talent or the experience isn't there. So I, I think it would be – I would think – yeah, I think it would be competitive. All right, then one follow-up. What do you think the result would be between, like, the worst of the worst in the XFL and the best college team? So, like, LSU, Bama, just, like, one of these, like, sick programs. Oh, man. I think – I'm always going to go pro. Like, guys are pro for a reason. Um, even at the XFL, NFL, CFL level, guys are pro for a reason. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with a pro team over a college team. But it would be – I think it would be competitive. Again, it would be competitive. 
All right, very fair. Our next question from Derek K. He asks, have you ever thought about just running for a first down even when a fake isn't called? <laughs> Not a chance. Not a chance. No. I mean, really, at the college, at the D1 college level and at the XFL, NFL level, like, you're thinking I'm getting this ball off. That's your first thought. Because you got guys on the edge who run sub four five that are trying to block it. And guys up the middle who are, you know, freak athletes, six five, two sixty, trying to come up right through the gut. So I mean, as a punter, you're thinking, or even kicker kicking a field goal, you're thinking, I'm getting this off. So yeah, that's never, never have you ever had like a bad snap and out of like scramble because you couldn't? Yeah, actually my first punt of my Northwestern career was a left-footed punt against Michigan. So, oh. fun fact for you. In the big house? No, that was home. That was home. Oh. Yeah. Some good trivia right there. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. Um, and then our last mailbag question. So, Ethan R. asks, so I want to become a professional punter one day. What would you nice. recommend like, young dudes, uh, potential punters, for making it in the big leagues one day? Yeah, so, I mean, if he's young, that's already a good start. Because, like I said, I didn't start till my sophomore year of high school. So, I, I hear guys are starting at, like, eight, six to eight years old now. So, I, you know, I can only imagine how good they're going to get. But um, I think it's all in the drop as a punter. So, if you can do, like, 100 drops a day, mm-hmm. I think you're going you're gonna to improve a lot. So now it's time for another segment uh, that I'm very excited about. I call it Deep Dives. Uh, so basically, over the past week or so, we've scoured your social media, your Twitter and Instagram, namely. Uh, and we're going to ask you about some of your old posts uh, and hear your thoughts. So uh, oh boy. first off, you are a big Cleveland sports fan. Uh, and in 2016, uh, you tweeted that LeBron had the greatest finals performance of all time. And you've retweeted a lot of LeBron content in general, including some MJ comparisons. So, Last Dance just came out. There's a lot of buzz around it. Where do you currently stand on the LeBron versus Jordan debate? That's a great question that literally I've been, since the last dance (laughs) came out, I've been talking to my friends about a lot. So, that's a great, relevant question for me. Um, And actually, for me, personally, just my opinion, don't have to like it. The last dance only verified for me that LeBron is the GOAT. Even now, if he retired now, he's the GOAT. And I say this because watching the last dance, you really got to see the level of competition that MJ played in the finals. I mean, he played against the old Lakers team. He played against Gary Payton Sonics, uh, older Utah Jazz team with Carl Malone and Stockton. They're great, but they were older, and it was literally just them. Um, and then you had the Pacers, the Pacers, that Pacers team took them seven games to get past them. And it was literally Reggie Miller and Rick Smith. To be fair, though, LeBron, like, Bron took seven games to get past, like, the old Depot Pacers in the first round. He's got a point. Yeah, but also it took MJ eight years to get to the finals. LeBron's been to – that was – that took him seven games after going to the finals for seven straight years. I mean, all- after three, after three ends, he's like, man, I'm tired. I need like a year and a half off. <laughs> that's that's fair, that's fair. LeBron, LeBron did have to go to Miami to get a title though. Yeah. And then he came back and won one in Cleveland. Did you see the Cleveland team he took to the finals? That in my opinion is one of the best playoff runs of any individual. That team he took to the finals against the Spurs, sure, he didn't win, but the team he carried, yeah, I've, can you guys even name uh, three guys who are on that roster? Like oh, it's Rodney one. Hood. <laughs> I want to no, say it was no. Farajal. Is that older? Is that was on that team? This is old. This is oh, like you're talking old. about uh, yeah. Anderson Farajal. Yeah. Uh, Mo, did he have Mo Williams that year? Uh, he might, he might have. I think it was, no, it was before Mo Williams. Wow. Pretty and sure. yeah, no, I can't name any of them. <laughs> yeah, so we're struggling for one name, and he took that team to the final. That, that's and a thing. And took down that Pistons team. That Pistons team was filthy. That's true. That's, this is true. I, I'm devil's advocating a bit, but I, I'm with you on, I'm with you on this debate. Cool. So I like to hear. 
All right, so your Instagram, like your Twitter, is also full of great content. Um, and we've heard you say before that you don't believe in deleting old posts. You like to keep keep your feeds authentic. Um, so we found a post from from back in November of 2016 of you tackling current Chargers defensive back, de- da, current Chargers defensive back Desmond King on a punt return. If I'm not mistaken, that was your only career tackle, right? Like, what was that? Oh, for sure, for sure. I had to have some fun with that. It was all, it was all fun and games, and I actually had a good conversation with him. I believe his girlfriend got involved at some point. Um, that's a that's a different story. But um, between he and I, you know, we're good. We still follow each other. He's he's a heck of a DB and a heck of a returner. You know, I just got the best of him that day. Yeah, <laughs> that's what that's what Instagram says. How much time do you spend even learning how to tackle as a punter? Uh, for us, the teams usually put about one day a year into it you know a nice a nice day in training camp or somewhere in preseason we'll get to get to thud a little bit (laughs) did you like lay him out or was it a more conventional tackle (laughs) i believe i caught him by the towel if i'm not mistaken and then i grabbed his legs and then he he kind of twirled down together but i still have his towel i think you gotta remember when Pat, what was it, Pat McAfee, he was, or was it Vinatieri who nailed that dude and they, they wanted him to take a steroid test and there was like a joke about it? What, what for a punter, does that give you some hope? Oh, yeah, I love that stuff. I mean, I had a few good tackles in high school, so a few sideline plays. So I'm not, I'm not afraid to tackle and I played football in the past. So. There we go. And I'm a big guy, so I can't, you know, I can't <laughs> just like not tackle. Um, okay, so more recently – uh, we sort of looked into your social media and we noticed that you've tried your hands some painting during quarantine. Uh, what inspired you to do that? Is that what you've been doing to stay busy really? Yeah. So this was right when the season ended. Um, I just wanted to take my mind kind of off things. And I love, you know, I love just the art side of things. I wish I had more time to do more stuff. I, I DJed a bit in college and, I love music and I love, you know, painting and just art in general. So I just wanted to do something different, something new. Um, So I just kind of came up with that idea and took me about three days to finish it. But um, I was pretty pleased with this. It was pretty fun. I would love to paint some more. What was your DJ career like in college? Oh, man, not nothing too crazy. Just did a few student events. Um, I did a few weddings. So it was fun, though. It was fun. Oh, pretty good. Weddings kind of yeah. legit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure at a wedding. Let me tell you. But it was fun. The people, the, the people getting married, they're only going to remember that for the rest of their life. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's, that's the pressure I'm talking about. Hey. All right, so that should do it for our deep dive section. Uh, so you've worked out for the Bears and the Steelers in the past, uh, and I've heard that it can take a while for a specialist to break into the NFL. It's kind of a long process. Uh, so what was your experience like with that in the NFL, um, and how do you feel about future opportunities um, in that thing? Yeah, so I definitely learned a lot in those experiences, just being in an NFL environment with NFL coaches and just – their wisdom and their experience even in um the bears it was just like a short few hours with the steelers it was the rookie mini camp um but i definitely learned a lot and learned what it takes to perform and stay at that level um and i'm I'm hopeful for this year you know we'll see what's to come especially with this whole coronavirus thing going on but i'm i'm working like crazy to put myself in the best position to succeed in the nfl and yeah like i said I'm, i'm hopeful for that for sure. Um, and then we know that you recently also hired Peter Schaefer as your agent, um, who's a pretty high profile dude, whose other clients include NFL stars like Barry Sanders, uh, Barry Sanders, Joe Thomas, and Joe Mixon. So what led to you making this move? And what does that mean for your future in football? Uh, for me personally, I was just kind of looking for someone with more experience and more knowledge. Um, and I appreciated everything that my first agent did for me and brought to the table but I just felt that it was time you know with the XFL situation ending and really wanting to do you know I only have one take at this so I just really wanted to put my best foot forward for myself and my family to get myself in the NFL and I felt like he had you know a great resume and um, has 
was willing to be my agent and, you know, had some good conversations with him. And I really respect his experience and his knowledge. And I feel that he gives me the best chance to um, land with the team. So what would your dream NFL destination be? Any team that will take me. (laughs) <laughs> Any team, honestly, honestly, I'm not, I am not picky and um, the dream is real. And I just want to, I want to punt and help a team in the NFL. I want to help a team win a Super Bowl. You know, as crazy as that might sound as a punter, I think punting and kicking plays a huge role in that. And, For sure. You know, I just, I just want to help. Just want to do my part. Are there teams do you think do like a particularly good job of special teams or that is that like an awesome program for that? So I particularly watch a lot of film of punters and there's a few guys that I think just stand out that are just, they're elite. And, you know, I think I look at guys who have like similar builds to me, similar, um, similar experiences to me. So three guys that I really like to watch film of, and I really think are fantastic punters are Johnny Hecker, Thomas Morstead and Brett Kern. I think those guys are phenomenal. They're super consistent, really good directionally. And I think that's how you, you stay in the NFL. You got to be super consistent and you got to be really, really good directionally. All right. So we have seen that you've been involved with a lot of uh, community service and charity uh, endeavors uh, throughout your life. Um, So what does that kind of mean to you and uh, how have you incorporated that into your life? Yeah, I feel like I've been extremely blessed um, in my experiences and just what football has given me in my life. And um, my parents always emphasized just giving back and making sure that you're a good mentor, a good role model for someone to look up to. And, you know, if they can, if you can inspire even one, one kid or help out one person that you should do it. And so I've always emphasized that and try to be um, outgoing and, you know, helping in whatever way I can. And I know I'm not, I'm I'm definitely not perfect that I'm definitely not. A perfect role role model but you know I think God has given me gifts to use and I I want to give back and help others do the same that's awesome to hear um and speaking of charity we have a special final segment for you which we like to call um trivia for charity and Lois you want to tell us more about that yeah so I uh a lot of other kind of podcasts have done this I kind of stole it from uh the Bob Menry podcast which I'm a big fan of uh, so basically we're going to ask you five trivia questions kind of related to your career. Um, and for every single one you get right, we're going to be donating $10 to the charity of your choice. Uh, we're pretty broke. So obviously it's not a whole lot, but we are doing what we can. Uh, and we're also going to drop the link, uh, whatever you're watching or listening, uh, on hopefully the link will be in the description as well. Um, so who will you be supporting today? Uh, today we're going to be supporting Compassion International. It's a nonprofit that helps at risk and impoverished youth around the world. Um, so definitely help out if you can give whatever you can. I know during this time, it's, it's really tough for all of us, but anything really helps these kids truly. All right. Sounds good. Let's get started. So first question is, uh, we talked a bit earlier about your time at the Steelers mini camp. Do you remember what number you wore during that camp? I think it was 17. Was it 17? Yes, that's correct. Yep. That's correct. Let's go. <laughs> 10 bucks in the books. Let's see our second Drop one. Drop it. All right, question two. So in your senior year, you recorded an 80-yard punt against Iowa, and it was your career long. But can you name your second longest career putt, how many yards it was, and against what team? I believe it was 73 yards against Minnesota that same year. Yep, that's right. That is exactly <laughs> what I wrote down. That's absurd. It says 73 yards against Minnesota that same year. We're, we're Let's go. Team. Wow. All right, so we're two for two so far. All right, Hunter, so you're a big guy at 6'5", but you were never the tallest on the team in Northwestern. Who was the tallest teammate you've had in your five years as a Wildcat? Wow. Wow, that's a tough one. Listed or actually – <laughs> it's a big difference. I mean, we're we're going unlisted, but okay. if you have a strong argument against that, then you know we'll give it to you. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to buy time. I'm thinking. <laughs> Definitely is alignment. Has to be alignment. Oh man, I'm gonna say it's probably about six seven. 
Um, I'm going to – oh, man. It could be – all right. I, I don't know. I know it's an O-lineman, but my best guess right now is uh, DN, uh, Dean Lowry at 6'6", six, six, but that can't, that can't be right. That is close. The correct answer based on the listing is Shane Mertz at 6'8". That's it. I knew 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 it. Damn. Pretty good, though. Pretty good so far. You are three of four. Uh, or excuse me, two of three. Uh, okay, so my question is, you played with linebacker Scooby Wright the third on the Defenders, uh, and is a diehard Arizona Wildcats fan, his alma mater. Do you know his real first name? Wow. <laughs> I never even thought about that. That's a really good question. He's just Scoob. I just scoop. Oh my goodness. No idea. That's a great question. No, <laughs> I don't even have an answer. Yeah, James. I don't know. That was a great guess. His real first name is Philip. Philip. <laughs> wow. It all makes sense. Wow. <laughs> all right. Last question for you here. And hopefully I don't get you in trouble with your wife. Um, but how many goals did your wife score in her Northwestern lacrosse career? Oh, shoot. You are going to get me in trouble. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, again, have no idea. These these questions got a lot. This is like a millionaire here. These questions yeah, got a lot hard harder. If you're married, if you're close enough, we'll give it to you. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to go with 42. <laughs> Oh, we'll give you, we'll give you one more 19. guess. Yes. <laughs> oh, you, 19. You, you say, okay, yeah. <laughs> 19. The answer is 19. Yeah. Oh, my but gosh. At least good, I went over. Good that you went yeah, over. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Significantly you, over is, is I'm sure she'll answer. appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. So I was not close. That was that was a good first couple of questions. Uh, congratulations on your success at trivia. Uh, you got two out of five, but we're going to give you uh, $30. Thank you very much for uh, participating there. And I think that's thank all you the guys. questions we have. Uh, so we appreciate you coming on. Hunter, we wanted to thank you again for coming on, for being the first guest of the After the Arc podcast. Um, it was really great to have you on. Thank you, guys. It was great to be a part of it, and I wish you guys all the best. We also want to thank all of our listeners for listening in for our first edition of After the Arch and maybe seeing it on YouTube, too. We'll be back soon with After the Arch Episode 2.